Welcome to Celtic Tomes, bringing you readings from bygone books. Welcome to Celtic Tomes, readings by Gary and Ruth from the classic books of Celtic lore and study. Book 4, Chapter 4 of British Goblins Welsh Folklore, Fairy Mythology, Legends and Traditions by Wirt Sykes Chapter 4 Early Inscribed Stones Including the Stone Pillar of Banwan Brothin Near Neath Catastrophe Accompanying Its Removal the Sagrana Stone and the White Lady, the Dancing Stones of Stackpool, human beings changed to stones, St Cana and the Shepherds, the Devil Stone at Llanarth, Rocking Stones and their accompanying superstitions, the Suspended Altar of Loingarth, Cromlex and their fairy legends, the Fairy's Castle at St Nicholas, Glamorganshire, the Stone of the Wolf Bitch, the Welsh Melusina, Park of Biguan Cromlech, and Connection of These Stones with Ancient Druidism. Section 1. Paleographic students are more or less familiar with about 70 early inscribed stones in Wales. The value of these monuments as corroborative evidence of historical facts in connection with waning popular traditions, is well understood. Superstitious prejudice is particularly active in connection with stones of this kind. The peasantry view them askance, and will destroy them if not restrained, as they usually are, by fear of evil results to themselves. Antiquaries have often reason to thank superstition for the existence in our day of these ancient monuments. But, there is a sort of progressive movement towards enlightenment which carries the Welsh farmer from the fearsome to the destructive stage in this connection. That dangerous thing, a little knowledge, sometimes leads its imbiber beyond the reach of all fear of the guardian fairy or demon of the stone, and yet leaves him so superstitious regarding it that he believes its influence to be baleful and its destruction a sort of duty. It was the common opinion of the peasantry in the parish in which it stood that whoever happened to read the inscription on the mine Hlotharog, an early inscribed stone on the top of a mountain near Margam Abbey in Glamorganshire, would die soon after. In many instances, the stones are believed to be transformed human beings, doomed to disguise for some sin, usually an act of sacrilege. Beliefs of this character would naturally be potent in influencing popular feelings against the stones. But on the other hand, however desirable might be their extinction, there would be perils involved, which one would rather his neighbour than himself should encounter. Various awful consequences, but especially the most terrific storms and disturbances of the earth, followed any meddling with them. At Banwan Brithin, a few miles from Neath, a stone pillar inscribed Marki Caratini Filii Berici long stood on a tumulus which by the peasants was considered a fairy ring. The late Lady Mackworth caused this stone to be removed to a grotto she was constructing on her grounds, and which she was ornamenting with all the curious stones she could collect. An old man, who was an undergardener on her estate, and who abounded with tales of goblins, declaring he had often had intercourse with these strange people, told the Reverend Mr. Williams of Tiracum that he had always known this act of sacrilege would not go unpunished by the guardians of the stone. He had more than once seen these sprites dancing of an evening in the rings of Banwan Brothin, where the wonder stone stood, but never since the day the stone was removed had any mortal seen them. Upon the stone, he said, were written mysterious words in the fairy language, which no one had ever been able to comprehend, not even Lady Mackworth herself. When her ladyship removed the stone to Knoll Gardens, 
The fairies were very much annoyed, and the grotto, which cost Lady Mackworth thousands of pounds to build, was no sooner finished than one night, Dune Catwony, there was such thunder and lightning as never was heard or seen in Glamorganshire before, and the next morning the grotto was gone. The hill had fallen over it and hidden it for ever. Yes, indeed, said the old man, and woe will fall on the Cumro, or the Saison that will dare to clear the earth away. I myself, and others who was there, was here the fairies laughing, loud that night, after the storm has cleared away. Section 2 The Sagranus Stone, at St. Dogmess, Pembrokeshire, was formerly used as a bridge over a brook, not far from where it at present stands, luckily with its inscribed face downwards, so that the sculpture remained unharmed, while generations were tramping over it. During its use as a bridge, it bore the reputation of being haunted by a white lady, who was constantly seen gliding over it at the witching hour of midnight. No man or woman could be induced to touch the strange stone after dark, and its supernatural reputation no doubt helped materially in its preservation unharmed till the present time. It is considered on paleographic grounds to be of the fourth century. In Pembrokeshire, also, are found the famous dancing stones of Stackpool. These are three upright stones, standing about a mile from each other, the first at Stackpool Warren, the second further to the west on a stone tumulus in a field known as Horstone Park, and the third still further westward. One of the many traditions concerning them is to the effect that on a certain day they meet and come down to the Sices Ford to dance, and after their revel is over, return home and resume their places. Section 3 there is a curious legend regarding three stones which once stood on the top of the Moylvery Hill in Carnarvonshire, but which were long ago rolled to the bottom of the hill by some idle-headed youths who dug them up. They were each about four feet high, standing as the corners of a triangle. One was red as blood, another white, and the third a pale blue. The tradition says that three women about the time when Christianity first began to be known in Britain, went up Moylvray Hill on a Sabbath morn to winnow their corn. They spread their winnowing sheet upon the ground and begun their work, when some of the neighbours came to them and reprehended them for working on the Lord's Day. But the women, having a greater eye to their worldly profit than to the observance of the fourth commandment, made light of their neighbours' words and went on working and thereupon they were instantly transformed into three pillars of stone, each stone of the same colour as the dress of the woman in whose place it stood, one red, one white, and the third bluish. Legends of the turning to stone of human beings occur in connection with many of the Minehirian long stones. Near Slandifradog, Anglesey, there is a Minehir of peculiar shape, from one point of view, it looks not unlike the figure of a humpback man, and it is called Carriga Schleider, or the robber's stone. The tradition connected with it is that a man who had stolen the church Bible and was carrying it away on his shoulder was turned into this stone and must stand here till the last trump sets him free. At Roldrich, or Roldrech, there is, or was, a circle of stones, concerning which tradition held that they were the human victims of a witch, who for some offence transformed them to this shape. In connection with this circle is preserved another form of superstitious belief, very often encountered, namely, that the number of stones in the circle cannot be correctly counted by a mortal. It is noteworthy that the only creature which shares with man the grim fate of being turned to stone in Welsh legends is the serpent. The monkish account of St. Cana, one of the daughters of Prince Brachan of Breconshire, relates that having consecrated her virginity to the Lord by a perpetual vow, she resolved to seek some desert place where she could give herself wholly up to meditation. So she journeyed beyond the River Severn, 
and there, meeting a woody place, she made her request to the prince of that country that she might be permitted to serve God in that solitude. His answer was he was very willing to grant her request, but that the place did so swarm with serpents that neither man nor beast could inhabit it. But she replied that her firm trust was in the name and assistance of Almighty God, to drive all that poisonous brood out of that region. Hereupon the place was granted to the Holy Virgin, who, prostrating herself before God, obtained of him to change the serpents and the vipers into stones. And to this day the stones in that region do resemble the windings of serpents through all the fields and villages as if they had been framed by the hand of the sculptor. The scene of this legend is mentioned by Camden as being at a place near Bristol called Keensham, where abundance of that fossil called by the naturalist Cornu Aminus is dug up. Section 4 Our old friend, the devil, is once more to the fore when we encounter the inscribed stone of the 12th century which stands in the churchyard of Llanath, near Aberon in Cardiganshire. A cross covers this stone with four circular holes at the junction of the arms. The current tradition of the place regarding it is that one stormy night there was such a tremendous noise heard in the belfry that the whole village was thrown into consternation. It was finally concluded that nobody but the Diowl could be the cause of this, and therefore the people fetched his reverence from the vicarage to go and request the intruder to depart. The vicar went up into the belfry, with bell, book and candle, along the narrower winding stone staircase, and, as was anticipated, there among the bells he saw the devil in person. The good man began the usual conjurate in nomine, etc., when the fiend sprang up and mounted upon the leads of the tower. The vicar was not to be balked, however, and boldly followed up the remainder of the staircase and got out also upon the leads. The devil, finding himself hard-pressed, had nothing for it but to jump over the battlements of the tower. He came down plump among the gravestones below, and falling upon one, made with his hands and knees the four holes now visible on the stone in question, which among the country people still bears the name of the Devil's Stone. Section 5 The Logan Stones in various parts of Wales, which vibrate mysteriously under the touch of a child's finger, and rock violently at a push from a man's stronger hand, are also considered by the superstitious a favourite resort of the fairies and the Diao. The holy aerolite, to which unnumbered multitudes bow down at Mecca, is indeed no stranger thing than the rocking stone and Pontypridd sky-perched common. Among the marvellous stones in Nennius is one concerning a certain altar in Loingarth in Gower, suspended by the power of God, which, he says, a legend tells us was brought thither in a ship, along with the dead body of some holy man, who desired to be buried near St. Ichtid's grave, and to remain unknown by name, lest he should become an object of too reverent regard. For Ichtid dwelt in a cave there, the mouth of which faced the sea in those days, and having received this charge, he buried the corpse, and built a church over it, enclosing the wonderful altar, which testified by more than one astounding miracle the divine power which sustained it. This is thought to be a myth relating to some Welsh rocking stone, no longer known. The temptation to throw down stones of this character has often been too much for the destruction-loving vulgarian, both in Wales and in other parts of the British Islands. But the offenders have seldom been the local peasantry, who believe that the guardians of the stone, the fairies, or the diowl as the case may be, will heavily avenge its overthrow. On the Overthrowers. Section 6. Venerable in their hoary antiquity stand those monuments of a long vanished humanity, the Cromlechs, which are so numerous in Wales, 
sharing with the Logan and the inscribed stone the peasant's superstitious interest. Even more than the others, these solemn rocks are surrounded with legends of enchantment. They figure in many fairy tales, like that of the shepherd of Renivaur, who stood watching their mad reverie about the old Cromlech, where they were dancing, making music on the harp, and chasing their companions in hilarious sort. That the fairies protect the Cromlechs with special care, as they also do Logans and others, is a belief the Welsh peasant shares with the superstitious in many lands. There is a remarkable Cromlech near the hamlet of St. Nicholas, Glamorganshire, on the estate of a family whose house has the honour of being haunted by the ghost of an admiral. This Cromlech is called by the children in the neighbourhood Castle Cuddick. A Cardiff gentleman, who asked some children who were playing round the Cromlech, what they termed it, was struck by the name, which recalled to him the Breton fairies thus designated. The Correts and Corregs of Brittany closely resemble the Welsh fairies in numberless details. The Corrids are supposed to live in the Cromlechs, of which they are believed to have been the builders. They dance around them at night, and woe betide the unhappy peasant who joins them in their roundels. Like beliefs attached to Cromlechs in the Haute Auvergne and other parts of France. A Cromlech at Pirol, said to have been built by a fay, is composed of seven massive stones, the largest being twelve feet long by eight and a half feet wide. The Fay carried these stones hither from a great distance and set them up, and the largest and heaviest one she carried on the top of her spindle, and so little was she incommoded by it that she continued to spin all the way. Section 7 Among the Welsh peasantry, the Cromlechs are called by a variety of names. One interesting group giving in Cardiganshire, the Stone of the Bitch. In Glamorganshire, the Stone of the Greyhound Bitch. In Carmarthenshire and in Monmouthshire, the Kennel of the Greyhound Bitch. And in some other parts of Wales, the Stone of the Wolf Bitch. These names refer to no fact of modern experience. They are legendary. The Cambrian form of the story of Melusina is before us here, with differing details. The wolf bitch of Welsh legend was a princess who for her sins was transformed to that shape, and thus long remained. Her name was Gust Rumhi, and she had two cubs while a wolf bitch, with which she dwelt in a cave. After long suffering in this wretched guise, she and her cubs were restored to their human form for Arthur, who sought her out. The unfortunate Melusina, it will be remembered, was never entirely robbed of her human form. Ange par la figure, et cependant par le reste. She was condemned by the lovely fay, Pressina, to become a serpent from the waist downwards on every Saturday, till she should meet a man who would marry her under certain specified conditions. The monkish touch is on the Welsh legend, in the medieval form in which we have it in the Mabinogi of Kiluch and Olwen. The princess is transformed into a wolf bitch for her sins, and when restored, although it is for Arthur, God did change her to a woman again. Section 8 In a field called Park Bigorn, near Slanboidi, Carmarthenshire, are the remains of a cromlech destroyed many years ago, concerning which an old man named John Jones related a superstitious tale. It was to the effect that there were ten men engaged in the work of throwing it down, and that when they were touching the stone, they became filled with awe. And moreover, as the stone was being drawn away by six horses, the road was suddenly rent asunder in a supernatural manner. This is a frequent phenomenon supposed by the Welsh peasantry to accompany the attempt to move a cromlech. Another common catastrophe is the breaking down of the wagon, not from the weight of the stone, but through the displeasure of its goblin guardians. Sometimes this awful labour is accompanied by fierce storms of hail and wind, or violent thunder and lightning. Sometimes by mysterious noises, or swarms of bees, which are supposed to be fairies in disguise. Section 9. A very great number of fanciful legends might be related 
in connection with stones of striking shape, or upon which there are peculiar marks and figures, but enough of this store of folklore has been given to serve present ends. If more were detailed, there would in all cases be found a family resemblance to the legends which have been presented, and which lead us now into the enchanted country where Arthur reigns, now wandering among the monkish records of church and abbey, now to the company of the dwarfs and giants of fairyland. That the British druids regarded many of these stones with idolatrous reverence is most probable. Some of them, as the Cromlechs and Logans, they no doubt employed in their mystic rites, as being symbols of the dimly described power they worshipped. Of their extreme antiquity there is no question. The rocking stones may be considered natural objects, though they were perhaps assisted to their remarkable poise by human hands. The Cromlechs were originally sepulchral chambers, unquestionably, but they are so old that neither history nor tradition gives any aid in assigning the date of their erection. Opinions that they were once pulpits of sun-worship, or druidic altars of sacrifice, are not unwarranted, perhaps, though necessarily conjectural. The evidence that the inscribed stones are simply funeral monuments is extensive and conclusive. Originally erected in honour of some great chief or warrior, they were venerated by the people, and became shrines about which the latter gathered in a spirit of devotion. With the lapse of ages, the warrior was forgotten. Even the language in which he was commemorated decayed, and the marks on the stones became to the peasantry meaningless hieroglyphics, to which was given a mysterious and awful significance. And so, for unnumbered centuries, the tombstone remained an object of superstitious fear and veneration. That was Book Four, Chapter Four of British Goblins, Welsh Folklore, Fairy Mythology, Legends and Traditions by Wirt Sykes. A link to the full text can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to comment on this chapter, pop over to our show notes and join in or start a conversation at celtictomes.libsyn.com. That's L I B S Y N dot com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, why not try our sister podcast, The Celtic Myth Pod Show, which brings the stories of ancient Celts to life with narrative and drama, as well as bringing you modern Celtic music, stories, and information. Find The Celtic Myth Pod Show in all the places where the best podcasts hang out or on our website at CelticMythPodShow.com. You've been listening to Celtic Tomes, read by Gary and Ruth. This podcast has been produced by The Celtic Myth Show.